Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gulf Coast Gardening. Uh, we're very happy to have you here with us this morning. We appreciate you taking your time to spend it with us this morning. Uh, we have a terrific speaker this morning. It's Paul Winsky. who will be talking about houseplant maintenance and identification. And be sure to join us on February 3rd when, when we have seasonal landscape pruning. Um, and uh, we'll have uh, uh, more things for you as well. Um, Please, a couple of housekeeping things. Make sure that you turn off your microphones and, and that you turn off your cameras so that everything will go smoothly this morning. If you have questions for the speaker, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and one of our uh, extension horticulturists will get back to you and, and try to get those answered as quickly as possible. And if there's something that we can't answer, then our speaker, I'm sure, will be more than happy to address that. Uh, with all that said, uh, please welcome this morning, Paul Winsky. All right, Kevin, um, assuming you can hear me OK. Yes, sir. All right, great. Uh, so let's get started. Um, as Kevin said, I am a uh, horticulture agent and I am uh, located here in Harris County. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about houseplants. Uh, this is a big, uh, it's a very hot topic. Uh, so I figured we'll delve into a little bit of maintenance and identification. By no means is this all inclusive, um, but if you've been thinking about getting into them or you've gotten a few lately, a uh, few houseplants, and you've got a couple questions, uh, hopefully this will help um, uh, answer those and, and, and get you started on the right, in the right direction. Paul, I cannot hear you now. Paul, you are muted for sure. OK, you can hear me now. I can hear you now. OK. All right. Let's see if we've got this all worked out now. I'm down to one screen, so I'm not used to doing this with only one screen. I'm used to doing two. OK, do you still still hear me? Yes, sir. OK, great. All right. So house plants have become very popular over the last uh, three to five years. Um, most of the house plants that are on the market are tropical foliage plants. Uh, and so with us growing here in the Gulf Coast, um, it gives us a little bit more flexibility because we can use them as house plants. And then in the spring and summer, you know, we can move them outdoors and enjoy them on the patio. So, um, it, you know, we, we've got dual, dual purpose here. Uh, the other thing is, you know, for the indoor, it do, they do help improve air quality. There's been a lot of studies. It does help improve air quality, um, the amount of plants that you would need um, to really uh, pull out those VOCs, uh, those volatile uh, pollutants and things um, is, is quite high, but anything that you can do to help improve that interior air um, is, is going to be a plus. So they, they not only look great, but they also are able to improve the air quality. Um, when we don't have success with them, it's usually down to one of these three things. We've either got them, it's either poor light, so we've got them in the, in the wrong plant in the wrong spot. Uh, it's the temperature. We've gone from one extreme to another, uh, and some of these plants don't like that. Or probably the biggest culprit is improper watering. We either love them to death and we water them too much and we turn them into bog plants, or um, we bring them home, we put them on the shelf or the windowsill, and we forget to water them and never water them again. So these are probably the three biggest problems that we can run into uh, with a uh, lack of success. Now, when you're out looking for these plants, you know, you're going to the garden centers and things like that. Um, you want to choose a plant that has its, its requirements are going to be similar to where you're going to have it in your house or in the office, all right? So uh, just like if you're landscaping outside, you wanna have the right plant for the right place. Uh, so we wanna choose, uh, we wanna get those plants that um, are gonna help us to be successful uh, while we introduce them uh, into that environment. Um, there's a lot of good information uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the web 
Uh, I'll have there's several links. I'll have a, a slide at the end with resources, and I'm sure uh, uh, they will post them in the chat box also. Uh, as you're looking at these plants, make sure that they are insect and disease free. OK, we want to start clean uh, and it's going to help us out. Uh, so we're going to be looking on the underside of the foliage. Uh, we want that foliage to be healthy. If we're seeing yellow leaves, we're seeing brown leaf margin, we're seeing any kind of spots or blotching. Um, don't even think about it. Leave it there um, because you're just going to start out um, with an issue. Uh, you're going to have problems and, um, you know, um, why have a headache? Uh, before you you need it um, so start out with a nice healthy plant you want to look for uh, leaf buds in the axles you want to see if it's got some new growth uh, if it does then you know you've got a plant that's healthy and of superior quality uh, the other thing i always like to tell people is and when i'm purchasing plants i turn it over i knock it out of the pot and i'm looking at the root system if I see nice, white, healthy roots, I don't see excessive moisture, I don't see any kind of rot. Um, the smell, you know, when, when roots are rotting, it's got that decay smell to it. Um, so look at that root system. Uh, you're the customer, you're paying for it. Don't just go off the top, uh, looking at the top of the plant, but also look at that root system. So what conditions are are these plants going to have to deal with? All right. So we're 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 talking about light, and that's going to involve the intense intensity, the duration, and the quality of light or the type of light. Um, watering, of course, temperature, uh, humidity, which can be tricky uh, depending on the time of year. Uh, ventilation uh, in an enclosed space. Um, if we're not getting good and good ventilation, uh, we, we can have other issues that we normally don't have or we take for granted when we're growing outdoors. Uh, and then the last one is fertilization. Uh, and there's a bullet under there with soluble salts, which could cause a problem and lead to the decline of the plant. So we're going to briefly touch on these as we work our way through uh, the slide deck here. The other thing I want to mention is um as as we go through these images see how um i use a lot of these because i i really like the way uh um they captured how you can use them in the in the uh interior in in the house in your residence in the office you know the type of containers things like that these you know it's a part of your it, it's a decorative accent you know it's something that you're bringing into that house so you know it looks great cleans the air, but you know, you can use it uh, as an advantage um, uh, in order to, uh, you know, make that interior space uh, come alive. So when we talk about light intensity, um, the intensity really depends on the nearness of the light source. So how close, the closer you are to the, to the light, the brighter it is, the further away, um, it isn't going to be as strong. All right. So house plants usually fall into three classifications a low, a medium, and a high. And so to understand this a little bit better, think about your house, all right? And think about if you've got south-facing windows. This is probably going to, this is going to be the most intense light, and we're not talking any kind of just that window, no trees in front of it with the sun coming through. It's going to be the most intense, and it will also also be the warmest. So we, 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 we want to always keep that um, in the back of our mind um, as to where we're going to play, plant, uh, place these plants uh, and what kind of conditions we're going to have to deal with, whether it's south facing. Um, we drop down one and we look at either the east or west windows. They're about 60% of the intensity of the south window. So you're losing about 40%. All right. So these are probably those moderate or medium uh, type uh, uh, light plants uh, that will do well on the east and or west windows. And then if you're facing north, all right, you've only got 20% of the intensity. So you're losing 80%. Uh, and, and this would be typical. You, you would, you know, consider that that's usually going to be your shadiest side. So take this into account. Be aware of this, you know, just as a rule of thumb that we know you're going to get your, you know, brightest light, most light in the south. Um, some reduction on the east and the west and north is going to be the lowest. So other factors, though, that you should consider is, you know, if especially if you've got curtains or shades, um, that's going to affect the intensity. Uh, if you've got blackout curtains, you're going to have to pull them back because you're not even going to get any filtered light uh, through there. If you've got trees out on the uh, in your landscape, 
uh, depending on the time of day, depending on the season, that's going to affect uh, the light intensity. Uh, the weather, we're overcast today, so we've got, you know, we're, we're not going to have the as, as, as strong an intensity as we would say on a sunny day. We're going to see differences in seasons. Uh, if you're living in a, if you, you know, if you're in the city, if you're an urban dweller, um, you know, you can have shade from other buildings that are going to be causing some issues. And last but not least, if your windows aren't clean, it could affect the intensity. So uh, clean windows will also help uh, to improve that intensity. Now, I like this. Um, uh, infographic, and there is a link for this um, at the end. This is from University of Florida, and I, I like it because it, it breaks down the low, uh, the medium, and the high light uh, requirements. And and foot candle, uh, it's it, it's an old uh, way of of measuring the light intensity, um, but it, it's it's just a nice rule of thumb. It it breaks it down by um, moisture uh, allowed to dry. Um, maybe the top inch or two to dry and then water and then plants that are moist. But you'll notice there are plants on here that um, say uh, the ZZ plant, which is one of my favorites. So it does well in the low, it does well in the medium, and it does well in the high. Uh, so that's one of the plants that, you know, these plants are very resilient. So even though uh, you may have a low light level, there are plants you can use, um, but then they are also adaptable to the higher light level. So uh, you can see the list grows as the amount of light increases. Uh, and so with the ZZ plant, for instance, you know, it's probably going to grow and be a little bit more prolific, uh, more new growth under the high light levels uh, versus the low light levels. But um, either way, you can bring in some color, you can bring in some live plants uh, even in these uh, low light conditions. Light duration probably isn't as much of an issue um, with foliage plants um, because they are not day length sensitive. Um, think about um, flower, certain flowering plants. Um, some, day, some plants are short days, some, day, some plants are, are long day. Like a poinsettia needs um, uh, minimal amount of day length, it's a short day plant. So it's a short day, long nights in order for them to, uh, to bloom. Um, but if light intensity uh, is an issue, uh, say you're on the north side uh, and you've got a lot of plants and you want to grow them, um, you can increase that intensity um, by increasing the duration by utilizing artificial light. Um, and if we're going to light the plants, we don't want to light them for more than 16 hours. Okay, when they're lit, they're photosynthesizing, they're making sugars, they're 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 doing their processes. Um, that plant needs to take a break. Uh, so you turn off those lights, uh, let it just respire, let it let it uh, sort of uh, take a rest, and then um, you can turn them back on uh, in the morning and, and let it go again. Your lighting options, if you want to increase that duration, um, incandescent bulbs are still out there, but they're probably pretty hard to find. Uh, and that wavelength is usually in the red and far red. Um, they usually run hot, so they're probably not the most efficient. Right now, the fluorescent and the LD, LED lights are probably the best to offer. Fluorescence in that more in that blue range, which is what these house plans pr prefer. And the LEDs, you can find, you can buy them um, in various mixes. Um, in the blue range, you can get the red range if you need them. So there are options if you've got low light areas. If the intensity is low and you want to improve that intensity, um, you can do that with lighting options and then lengthen the date length and improve that duration. All right, watering. Um, probably most plant losses are going to be due to either overwatering or uh, underwatering. All right, as I said earlier, we're we're either going to love them to death or we're going to forget about them. Uh, and the the thing you want to remember is when you're dealing with the, these house plants is, um, you know, the root system is in that bottom two thirds of the pot as as it grows out and establishes. And so we want to make sure that when we water we're getting that water down into that soil column, down into that pot. So those feeder roots, everything can take advantage of, of that moisture. If we're just basing it off of the top inch, the top inch is wet, 
uh, or the top inch is dry and I'm just watering enough to, to wet that top inch, um, we're missing the boat. Um, we're missing where all those roots, uh, the root systems are and, and where we need to get that water. So the best way to water is when you do water, water till it runs out the bottom. And this, this will accomplish two things. One, um, if you've got excessive salt buildup because you're fertilizing, maybe you're fertilizing too much, um, this will help flush out that uh, excess salt and, and, and get away from any issues. Uh, the other thing is we're making sure that we're getting that water down to where that root system is going to be uh, and that plant's going to be happy. Now, a lot of times we with house plants, you know, we've got our little trays underneath and things like that. Um, and when we water, we can see the water comes through, we capture it. Um, should we let that uh, uh, plant sit there uh, in that water? Um, the best practice would be no. Um, don't let it sit there because then this is where we run into the issues of too much water. Um, we can pot, pot, potentially get root rot and things like that. Now, if you do have that tray and you put some gravel in it, in that tray uh, that the pot is sitting in, um, and the water comes through and the water is now in that gravel in that tray, um, that's a good thing because that will help improve the humidity. And humidity can be a limiting factor um, when we're growing these house plants. So we don't want the bottom of the pot sitting in water. We don't want those roots sitting in water. We want to make sure we get a nice flush. We get it all the way through the, the, the soil column. Uh, and if we do have a tray, you know, put a layer of gravel in there let the water sit in that gravel, but we don't want that bottom of the pot uh, sitting in the water. Temperature, um, ideally we want it say in that 70 to 80 degree range. And this is gonna depend because I know in the summertime people like to keep their houses very cool. Um, so, uh, but these plants will adapt. Uh, so this is just a rule of thumb, about 70 to 80 during the day, night temperatures, ideally in that 60 to 68 degree range. So it, it, it just depends on your condition. If your temperatures are too high or too low, or, or you go, you know, we get a swing from one to the other, um, you know, we're gonna, you're, the plant's gonna let you know it's not happy. Um, and this is gonna occur by reduced growth. Um, uh, you're gonna see some stretching or a spindly appearance. And the foliage, usually the older foliage will drop. Uh, then you know something's, you know, something's amiss, some, something's wrong. And it could be this temperature uh, could be an issue. Uh, we'll see this a lot when we bring sometimes new plants in. Um, Ficus benjamina is, is probably the most uh, temperamental plant. Uh, you can bring that in, it could look great. And then you set it somewhere and uh, you know that foliage just isn't ready for that spot and it will drop its foliage, but then normally it flushes out and is, is ready to go again. So um, these plants will let you know um, when there is an issue. Um, I mentioned humidity, especially this time of year. Um, you know, we're in Houston, hu humidity is not usually an issue, but you know, just the other day, I think they said our humidity was only uh, you know, like 15, 20%, which is very odd. You know, if we were in Arizona, it'd be, you know, a whole different story. Um, so the humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. So when our houses are closed up, um, you know, if we're running the heat and it's dry heat, uh, we can have some issues. Uh, and so how do we increase that humidity in order to help these plants, you know, uh, adapt and, and, and grow and thrive? Now, as I mentioned in that first slide, a lot of these are tropical plants. So they, they would prefer having that humidity. So some people, you know, they might have certain areas where they keep a lot of their house plants. They'll run a humidifier in there. Others will, as I mentioned, this gravel tray under the pots, um, again, it's not sitting in the water, but the water's there and is able to, to dry, you know, uh, uh, that moisture is able to uh, dry over time and it improves uh, the humidity. Uh, and, and think about, the, you know, as these plants are set up uh, around your house, you know, each of those plants are going to have a different microclimate. Uh, so that, that gravel or that tray you know, helps improve that microclimate where that plant is. Uh, the other thing is you can just come in and mist them. Um, but the recommendation is we want you to mist them early in the morning. Uh, we don't want you to go to work all day, come home at about five or six mist, and then it gets dark 
and then the foliage is wet. Uh, that's not going to help the plant. You're going to end up with disease issues. So the best thing is, you know, you mist it in the morning as the light intensity goes up. Um, it allows that to dry off. Uh, that microclimate around that plant, the humidity, humidity will increase uh, and the plant's going to be happy and thrive. Uh, ventilation it ties in sort of with that humidity. Um, you know, house plants can be se uh, sensitive to drift. So if you bring a plant in uh, and you're setting it, you know, say in your entryway and, you know, that door opens and closes and, you know, you have drafts and things like that. Um, if it's not, if it doesn't like that situation, um, you'll see some discolored foliage, you'll see foliage drop. Um, the other thing we have to deal with, especially this time of year, or or actually year round, you know, whether you're running the heat or the air conditioning, um, is where you place these plants. Be aware of the, you know, the air ducts, those uh, the vents overhead. Um, you you probably don't want to set that plant right in line where that dry that air is coming out, um, because it could cause the plant to dry out too rapidly, and then it's going to stress. Um, that root system because you've only got a you know certain amount of soil and a certain amount of roots and so if it's drying out too quickly um, you can run into issues uh, and then fertilization um, all plants need fertilizer um, are you going to have to fertilize a house plant as often as your bedding plants outside probably not um, so it's going to depend on how that plant is, how vigorous it's growing, um, the stage that it's in and the age of that plant. You know, a younger plant that's starting out, uh, maybe putting on more new growth than maybe some of the older ones. So you ju just be, you know, uh, watch that plant and get an idea of what's going on. Um, in most cases, a one to one ratio is going to be fine. You know, so like a 14, 14, 14 or a 20, 20, 20. But there are plenty of house plant fertilizers out there and they are available in all forms uh, whether it's a granular a liquid uh, a tablet um, the main thing is whatever you purchase uh, you know just read and follow the label directions uh, and you'll be successful uh, in this picture this is um, you know a slow release which is kind of nice you can put it out say early uh, spring when the plant starts to uh, sort of wake up conditions are better and you usually, in most cases, get like a, uh, uh, say, a six to nine month release rate. So if you put it out in March, it will take you through the entire season. So um, uh, these are kind of nice and kind of easy. Um, these prills or these little um, uh, circular BBs, they, 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 the, the coating, um, they're at different thicknesses uh, and they will release the fertilizer uh, over time. The other question we often get is, when do you fertilize? And you want to fertilize when that plant is actively growing. So normally, we're, we're going to say rule of thumb, maybe March from March through September. So this time of year, I would not recommend fertilizing uh, any of your indoor plants, you know, unless you've got them, you know, they're under grow lights and they're actively growing and you're seeing a lot of growth. Um, OK, but for most people, um, you're probably gonna, not going to need to fertilize at this time of year. And how often is really going to depend on the plant. Um, you know, if, if you're going with a time release uh, like this, you know, you put out your application and say March or April, again, it, it's going to carry you through the entire uh, growing uh, season. Uh, if you're using a liquid, maybe it's once a month. Maybe it's every six weeks. Um, in some cases, it could be every two weeks. So it just depends on that plant uh, and how it responds to it. All right, so if we're fertilizing, we could run into some issues with what we call soluble salts. And, and this usually results in if, if our soluble salts are getting too high, um, you know, the, the, the fertilizer is, is staying in that soil column. It's not, uh, the, the plants aren't, um, they've pulled out whatever they need in the nutrients, but there's still some left behind. Um, and so what we start to see is reduced growth, um, brown leaf tips. We can see dropping of the lower foliage, uh, turn the pot over, pull the pot up. If we're starting to see dead root tips, it's because of the high salt content. 
Uh, and then sometimes we'll see wilting. So even though you're watering, um, you're probably not watering enough and uh, because you're not getting out those salts. And so we start to see wilting and we think, oh, it needs more water, needs more water. Uh, and, and one thing leads to another. Um, ideal, usually what we'll see is that when we have a soluble salt problem, we're going to see that start to accumulate on the surface. It'll get crusty. It might have a yellow or white look to it. Um, if you're growing in clay pots, if you've got high soluble salts, they're going to accumulate on the outside of the pot. And I'm sure you've probably seen this. Uh, you start to see this white uh, dusty type uh, accumulation on the outside of the pot. The best way to help fix this is we, either when we water, we water on a regular basis. When you water, you water so we uh, leach out some of that. But in extreme cases, you know, we're going to have to leach that pot with at least twice the volume uh, of water that, that that pot would hold. So if it's a quart pot, you're going to want to water through two, two quarts of water in order to flush that out uh, and get those soluble salts out. Uh, it'll take a little time for that plant to uh, bounce back, but over time, if you catch it early enough, uh, the plant should be fine. All right, a couple other considerations that we want to talk about um, is about the pots. You know, I mentioned this because it's part of your, you know, interior decorations and things like that. We want to make sure we've got a good potting mix. And of course, with all plants, we've always got to deal with insects and pests. So our pots, um, the main thing is we want to make sure we've got a container that's large enough um, that it's going to provide enough space, you know, for that root, uh, for those roots to grow. Uh, and then we want to make sure it's got holes for the drainage. Now, you know, you can see in this image, um, I'm sure these pots are just decorative. They're just dropping the whole plant in with another pot. And when they water, they pull the, the whole plant out. Um, set it down, water it, let it dry, and then they put that pot back in. So just be aware, especially with the, a lot of these interior pots, some of them are just for decoration. You don't want to use them. You don't want to grow the plant in them. You want to have them in a similar size pot that slips in there nicely. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, it'll be a much better presentation. And they are just like outdoor pots, whether you're doing combination planters or whatever, they're available in just about any material, whether it's ceramic, plastic, clay, fiberglass, or metal. And so it, it really is just going to depend on, you know, the plant, the colors that you want to work with, the, the, the design, that all comes into play. Um, but there's a, you know, you, you go walk around at home or, or Depot or Lowe's or any of these garden centers, uh, and there's just a, a, a myriad of colors uh, and different textures that you can uh, work into your design. Our potting soil, we want a good mix, just, just like uh, well, whether we're growing our seedlings, our tr tomato transplants, we want a good mix. We want it to be porous. We don't want it to hold water for too long. Um, so um, we do not recommend going outside digging up a shovel full or so a bucket of your your soil mix from from the garden and using that as your uh, mix for your house plants um, you're going to have problems um, so we want it porous if it's porous we're going to have good uh, root aeration and we're going to have good drainage uh, and then the water and the nutrients the roots are going to be able to get to them uh, and and pull out what it needs a lot, there's a lot of commercial mixes out there. They're usually what we call soilless mix, so there's no soil in it, but it's a combination of peat moss, perlite, vermiculite, and a lot of them do have a, a, a slight slow-release fertilizer charge in it. So, um, you know, just as you're getting the plant started, it's nice to have a little bit there uh, when you transplant it into it. So um, a good potting mix is always going to be key. And then last but not least, you know, we've got insects and pests. Um, if your plant is healthy, it's usually going to, you know, hold up much better. If it's under stress, it's going to be more susceptible. So some of the things that we talked about earlier, you know, whether it's the, the ventilation or the humidity or overwatering or underwatering or whatever it is, um, if that plant is stressed, it can be more susceptible to both insects and diseases. Um, the interesting thing is with a lot of um, houseplants, um, 
a lot of times we'll see population spikes. Um, they're caused by when you go and you go and purchase new plants uh, and you bring them in and, and maybe you didn't inspect them well enough and you bought in some eggs of uh, whitefly or mealybug, which we're looking at here. Um, so it's a good practice to maybe as you buy some new plants or you get some new plants in, keep them in an area maybe that's away from the rest of your plant population. Uh, inspect them for a week or so, keep them in quarantine. We know what quarantine's all about with what's going on with the COVID-19, but keep them away, you know, until you can see if anything starts flying around or you start to see something. So give them a week or two and, um, you know, it, it's going to save you some headaches down the road. And I like to talk about the filthy five. These are probably the five top insects that you're going to deal with, um, with these house plants. Um, white fly, mealybugs, spider mites, aphids, and fungus gnats. Um, so white fly, uh, you're going to want to look on the underside of the foliage uh, because that's where the adults will hide out and lay their eggs uh, and the pupae will live. Mealybugs, as you can see in this image, are going to be in the uh, along the stem and the axils of the leaves. Uh, so that's where to look for those. Spider mites, We'll see those when we get to very dry conditions. So like this time of year, if the humidity is not high, spider mites like it warm and dry. Uh, so again, that's another one that you're going to want to look on the underside of the foliage. Um, if you start to see some webbing, you've probably got some spider mite damage. Aphids will look them all along the, uh, the length of the stem. They've got that piercing sucking mouth part, and they're probably going to be near the new growth because it's nice and soft and succulent. Fungus gnats will be an issue uh, if you've got your soil too wet uh, in that pot. Uh, the adults aren't the issue. It's the larvae that cause the problem. So the adults will lay their eggs in the soil. And if it's too moist, too wet, um, that egg will hatch. And then those larvae will feed on those nice, soft, young roots uh, in that plant. And then you'll have your, it, your problems. So these are probably the top five that you'll deal with. Um, a couple of the, there's two um, links, one from the University of Minnesota, and the other one is from Colorado State that goes into more in-depth information on uh, dealing with pests in your houseplants. All right, so let's talk about uh, some of the, the plants that are available um, out there. Again, this is not inclusive and there's, uh, you know, it, it, there's more plants now than the, you can shake a stick at and variations of some of these that we're, that we'll cover. Um, so Aglaonema, Chinese evergreen, um, very hardy plant, great foliage. Th th this is a, you know, the first few are probably, actually all of these are really good, strong beginner plants. Um, so if you haven't worked with them yet or you're thinking about it, these are ones that maybe you want to consider. So we normally see with uh, aglaonema this um, nice dark green foliage, the silver patterns, pretty nice underside. Um, it will tolerate multiple conditions. Uh, light can go from low to medium. Will it grow in high? Absolutely. Uh, um, but ideally, this is more of a low, uh, low to medium light and likewise with the water. So if you forget to water it, um, it should bounce back pretty quickly. Um, but the thing is now uh, look at these uh, images down below. These are all aglaonema also. So uh, again, uh, whether it's breeding, whether it's finding them uh, in, in, in the tropics or where, wherever these uh, companies uh, have these folks, um, there's always variation. So you can see how these colors and textures um, can add some really unique interest uh, to your indoor houseplant collection. And the price on some of these uh, is really pretty uh, eye-opening. So, um, you know, there's uh, a, a lot of interest and there's online auctions and things like that. So there's some really unique things. Um, snake plant, Sansevieria trifasciata. Uh, this is tried and true. Um, I'm sure, gosh, as a kid, I remember seeing the uh, uh, ladies in the neighborhood. They always had these in their windowsills and they would just grow forever and ever. So these are very adaptable um, and they add a nice architectural look uh, to the interior. They've got that nice 
upright, stiff habit. You know, this plant isn't going to flop over. Um, so they've got that sword like leaves. Um, and the variegation is, is just this is probably uh, the image here on the, the right side is probably what we're used to seeing. Uh, and even before it was just maybe just all green. Uh, but look at the image above where you can see the various uh, variegations that are available out there now. Uh, so again, everything is 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 evolving. Uh, we're seeing some really interesting color breaks and and introductions. Likewise, this plant will go, you know, whether it's low to high, and water requirements are quite low. So when we say quite low, you know, we want to let it dry out, let that first inch or two of uh, soil surface uh, dry before we come in and um, water again. Here's the ZZ plant. I also like saying the name Zamiococcus zamifolia, um, and this this is an indestructible plant. I, I've uh, uh, the 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 look of it. The presentation is really nice. It's shiny. It's waxy, and it you know you don't a lot of um, house plants, uh, especially if you get them from a florist, they'll they'll spray them with something called green sheen to make that foliage you know. Uh, look uh, clean and, and glossy. This plant doesn't need it. This plant looks that way all the time. Very dark green foliage. The interesting thing is that this plant was first discovered in East Africa in the 1800s, but this plant didn't come to the market until about the 1990s. So it was in collections, it was there growing, and then someone got the idea of um, you know, let's look at this for the house plant industry. It propagates um, quite easily. Uh, it does take some time. You can propagate this um, from a leaf cutting. Um, mine I've divided several times and my wife takes a plan into work and uses it. Um, but just, you know, this presentation in this type pot and, uh, you know, j just the growth habit is, is, is really nice and clean with it. So it, it is very adaptable. Um, watering is low to medium. Um, honestly, Mayan, if I water it once a month, um, I'm lucky and my plant, I, I haven't lost it. And I've had this plant for gosh, at least, uh, 10 to 12 years. So it, it, it's a very good plant. Um, and the other, the other thing, uh, I guess my other testimonial is when my kids moved out and they got their first apartments, uh, I bought them. They all got ZZ plants and their plants are all thriving. So if uh, 20 somethings uh, that now granted, uh, you know, they've seen me take care of plants and things like that, but um, their plants are doing just well. So it, it, it's a great starter plant, uh, great gift plant, and um, uh, you will enjoy this for quite a while. Uh, ponytail palm is one that has a really cool look to it. And, you know, it's got that wispy. Uh, you know, that cousin it look to it uh, with that foliage. Uh, it is a slow grower, but over time uh, it can reach several several feet. So you can go from a tabletop plant to maybe something that would stand up in the corner um, uh, over time. Uh, that thick trunk down in through here will store water. So this is one that if you're going to kill, it's pretty indestructible, but if you kill it, you probably watered it too much and you got rot and you've got issues that way. So again, light levels from low through high um, and water is, ver is low to medium. So if you forget to water it, that's probably a good thing. Uh, you don't want to kill this one with kindness. Boston Fern has been around for ages. Um, but it's got a great look to it. You know, it's got that graceful arching foliage, nice dark emerald green. Um, this one is going to prefer, you know, some humidity. So misting this or having, uh, you know, those pebbles uh, in the uh, in the tray is going to help it because, you know, most ferns, they like that moist soil. They like a humid type uh, environment. So light on this one, we and we don't want real high light uh, on the fern. Um, we want, you know, medium light at least, um, and in the water we want medium. So we, we want to keep that soil mo moist, you know, maybe the top inch dries out, but not, we don't want a, a strong dry out because, um, this plant probably will not be as resilient, won't come back, um, if we dry it out for too long. Uh, Diefenbachia, 
this is another one that's got a bold look to it. There's a lot of different variegations out there now, but it's got that lush foliage. Um, and the colors now are, you know, we've got cream and yellows and whites and different kind of central variegations. So depending on what you want, you know, to look or that presentation, you can you can find it with the Diefenbachia. Um, that upright habit uh, is kind of nice. Over time, you know, this is another one that you can start out buying a small six inch plant, which is fitting on the, you know, on the tabletop or the windowsill. Uh, and then over time, you can end up with uh, something like this. So it's one that can grow with you um, as you take care of it. So uh, light conditions are low through high and medium uh, watering uh, is a medium requirement. Uh, Red edge Dracaena, Dracaena marginata uh, is, is another one that, you know, you want, if you're looking for something tall, um, you can buy tall ones right away. If you want tabletop ones, um, you can do that also. Uh, the texture on these is, is really kind of nice, um, whether it's a tabletop or as it gets older. Um, nice upright habit. There's a tricolor version out there uh, that's got pink and white in it with a little bit of red. So light requirements, again, very adaptable and water is a uh, medium requirement. Uh, if we want some flowers, uh, peace lily spathophyllum is, is one that will do well. Uh, nice broad uh, foliage that sort of arches and, and will uh, cascade over. Uh, it gets this nice flower. It looks almost like a calla, a calla lily. So, uh, and the nice thing about it is that uh, flower stem comes up uh, through the foliage uh, and presents itself nicely above the foliage so you can see you don't have to look down in there. Um, this is going to do best in higher light and the reason why I say that is um, the more light the more flower production you'll get on it. Um, so you'll see uh, you know it, it might sound contradictory the light says low medium and dark so if you want more flowers um, I'm sorry, that should be low, medium, and high. I don't know why I have dark there, but it should be low, medium, high with the light. Um, high lighter, high, higher light levels, we're going to have more flower production. Lower light levels, you'll get a sporadic type of blooming. Uh, one here, one there. So ju just keep that into account. But if you just want to grow for its foliage, you know, you can do it in the low to medium. And when you get a flower, you can just enjoy it and and it's an added benefit. Um, water, this one likes to be, you know, not sopping wet, but you don't want it to dry out also. Uh, you'll, you'll see the uh, the effects on the foliage. Um, so, uh, a, you know, a level amount of moisture in there uh, is going to be uh, much better than allowing this to uh, uh, dry for too much. Philodendron is a classic. Uh, this is another one that I think everybody has had growing at one point. It's very easy to grow. Um, the variety that's out there now with regard to the foliage and the variegation uh, is, is, is really pretty impressive. It, it, it's been interesting to see how this has evolved over time um, from this typical green heart-shaped leaf uh, to some of the other ones that are out there. Um, since it is a vine, you know, you can use it in, in hanging baskets, uh, you can train it on a trellis. Um, this one here on the right is on a to totem, so that's sort of like a, a coconut core uh, totem uh, that you can train it to, to, to um, grow up and it gives you that vertical look. So it gives you a different look uh, in the home uh, and very adaptable for both light and then water requirement is in that medium range. Uh, corn plant, Dracaena fragrance, Misangiana. Uh, this one's interesting because it's got that thick woody trunk. Uh, and then as the uh, buds elongate and emerge, we get these clusters of uh, this nice corn-like looking foliage. Uh, nice variegation to it, uh, sort of a, a yellowish chartreuse central variegation uh, with the dark green. So it's a very, very good plant and it's one that, you know, the smaller ones are going to be tabletop and then as they mature, um, you've got something that is got a, more of a, a dramatic effect. Uh, light levels low through high and water recommendation is, is medium on this one. 
and then the croton. So we we see crotons in the landscape around here. Um, but you know, I grew up in uh, Pennsylvania. Th this was a house plant for us. You know, I never realized growing up that this was a uh, you know a landscape plant down in South Florida and areas around here. Um, but if you want a bold statement, you know, croton is the way to go. You're going to get some great color. Um, anywhere in those yellows, oranges, and reds. Um, and now the foliage, uh, the different types of foliage, this is, you know, sort of that typical uh, entire leaf, but now they've got them where they're serrated, they're, um, they're, they're really very interesting. They've got more spots on them. So, uh, you know, you could get into, if you become a, a, a croton collector, um, you, you could uh, definitely, if you go down that rabbit hole, you're going to find a lot of different genetics and a lot of different plants out there. So great with that top tr tropical touch. Um, this is one if it go, if we go one extreme to the other or or the other with regard to soil moisture. If we keep it too wet or if it's too dry, we will start to see the leaves drop. Um, so we want to keep a constant moisture. So where where we have their water medium, we we want we don't want it to dry out. Um, but we don't want it sopping wet. And the higher the light levels, the much better the, the colors are going to present themselves. So ideally, we want this in a high um, light area in order for those colors to really uh, present themselves. The spider plant is another tried and true one, Chlorophytum camosum. Um, ideally uh, thrives in high light. Um, you'll get more production of the, the baby plants coming off it. I remember growing up you know, uh, everybody called it the airplane plant because of the way the stems would come off and the little plants would come, you know, uh, develop on the ends of them. Um, and it, 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 it's great with kids. The, it, it's very easy to, to root these, whether you use soil or put them in some water. Um, so uh, it, it just performs extremely well. Uh, it's another one that you, you know, you got to go to extremes to really kill this one. Um, the one thing you do have to watch is since that growth habit is so thick and full, especially in these hanging baskets, you know, you could insect populations can take off on you rather quickly. So you just want to keep an eye on that. And this plant would divide very easily. Um, you'd have more plants between the uh, babies coming off of it and um, uh, the main plant. If you did divisions off of that, you would have a ton of plants. So it's, it's a great pass along plant uh, to someone. Uh, if, if you uh, start to uh, produce too many of them. All right, um, so uh, that covers uh, the plants, um, the culture of them, growing them. Here's a couple of the resources. I'm going to leave these up. Hopefully the guys have been putting these in the chat box, but if you wish to um, take a picture of this, I'll leave it up here for a little bit. Um, University of Arkansas site uh, has a good um, the main article is good, but then there's a lot of links to it. Um, the next one is a just a two pager, and that's uh, was done over in uh, with A and M AgriLife Extension, Travis County. Uh, Daphne did that, who, who's also one of our horde agents, and it's a uh, it's a nice, quick, um, easy read. Um, the next two with house plant pest, Colorado State, and the other one is from University of Minnesota. Um, they are really good, very in-depth with regard to um, insect identification and control uh, management options. And then the last one is that infographic that I showed early on, that uh, the houseplants, the gardening solutions from University of Florida. So that's an another handy one, a quick reference to uh, help you figure out where some of these plants would possibly fit at your home, in your home. Um, and, you know, not only with the light, but also the uh, moisture requirements. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I appreciate your time. I hope you've, you've uh, you know, found this useful. Um, and we uh, look forward to seeing you in uh, another two weeks when um, Stephen Brugerhoff will be talking on uh, seasonal landscape pruning. So, um, I guess Kevin or, or Skip or whoever's there, do we have any questions? Uh, we've been answering them as, as we've been going. Great. Um, we do have one person that has their hand up, but I don't know if that was intentional or not. Uh, trying to see it. Uh, Mar Mary Hanley 
has her hand up. I don't know if Mary has a question or not. Mary, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Can do you, you hear me? Yes. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. When All you right. bring home plants, um, the, you mentioned that these little bugs that come out of the soil, what would you treat that with so you don't kill the plant? And um, would you, I've heard so much about compost. Would you add compost to any of these plant pots? So bugs and compost. Okay, so off the top of my head, I know, all right, so for the fungus gnats, um, there are certain things that you can use as a drench and either of those other, um, the Colorado State link or the Minnesota link um, will have the specifics. If I was using beneficial insects, um, there are several, there's a nematodes that you can drench that will attack, attack those, um, uh, uh, the larvae. A lot of times, if, if you just run that plant a little bit on the dry side for a while, um, they will die off because they thrive in a very moist environment. So the, the fungus gnats, when she, uh, she lays her eggs, um, the larvae are, are in that soil. And if we dry that soil down, and they usually stay within that top inch or so. So if we dry that out, um, they're going to die off because they're, they're not going to be happy. Um, so that's one way of being able to control it. Uh, and then the other question was, what was the second part? Compost. Compost. Um, I have not used compost. I'm, I'm sure there are folks that will use it as part of an amendment if they mix their own. Um, but I have not, um, and I did not come across any information with regard to using compost. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm not aware, but I'm sure there are folks that probably mix their own soil and they'll use compost maybe with some verm uh, vermiculite or perlite or something like that. But, you know, over time, the only thing I, you know, that over time that that soil is going to break down and, and you're going to get some compaction. And I'm not sure how long that compost is going to last under these growing conditions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Okay, Paul, we, we have a request. If you uh, have a list of plants that are good for school classrooms, if you could include those in your follow up email. Okay. School classrooms. Sure. And actually, um, you know, most I, I'm thinking, I'm assuming they want it more. That that twelve, I, I I presented twelve plants, and all of those plants should do extremely well under the fluorescent lights in a school classroom. Um, you know, if, if you go with the spider plant, uh, you have it in a hanging basket. The kids can then take off the baby plants and root them. Um, you know, you you've got the um, yeah, th 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 those twelve should be a can't miss for the classroom. Um, not an issue. Um, any of the vines would be easy to propagate. You can take cuttings off of them. Um, so I think the only one I would probably maybe stay away from is the uh, spathophyllum, the uh, peace lily, but any of those tropical foliage plants should thrive there and, and do well. All right, the only other thing that was requested was that you uh, redisplay the links, but I just went ahead and copied it. I want all and posted them into the chat all at one time, so. Okay. All so. right, sounds good. All right. Uh, I saw one just pop up. What plants are poisonous for toddlers? Um, now I know Diefenbachia, they used to call that mother-in-law's tongue because if you ate too much of it, um, it could cause your uh, tongue to swell. Um, so I know Diefenbachia has some uh, issues, uh, but the rest of them I'm not aware of. Um, so, uh, and it might be, you know, that that might be, I know there's a website with regard to poisonous plants, uh, and I'm sure you can probably find that if you Googled it, uh, you'd be able to find that also. We posted a link, uh, one of the 
of the participants posted a link to ASPCA. OK, which has a good list for um, cat and dog. Right. Well. And, and, and again, you know, the, the, the other thing is it's always that quantity. So, you know, if if for for some reason they took a bite of a leaf, um, again, everybody's different. It, it may not be that big. Uh, you know, it may not be an issue uh, if they, you know, started eating, you know, several leaves and things like that, then, um, you know, you can run into some problems. All right. I think that's all of the questions. So great. All right. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you all for joining us today, uh, for gardening in the Gulf coast. And, uh, I guess we'll see you back in two weeks. So, uh, everybody stay safe and, uh, stay healthy.